Welcome to Learning English from the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Our 30-minute program is designed for people learning English. Today, we hear reports from Mario Ritter, Brian Lynn, and me. And we close the show with an American story. The numbers of dead and missing continue to rise in what is being called California's deadliest wildfire. By Friday, officials said at least 63 people had died. 631 people are listed as missing from the fire in Northern California. And three people are dead as a result of another fire near Los Angeles in Southern California. The sheriff of Butte County said the number of missing people probably includes some who fled the fire. He said he is making the list public so people can let officials know if they survived. About 52,000 people have fled. They have sought shelter in the homes of friends and relatives, hotels, and even in the parking lot of a Walmart store in the town of Chico. The fire in Northern California began about one week ago in Paradise, a town of 27,000 people. There is a story about Paradise. More than 170 years ago, a group of workers enjoyed their break in the forest with the cool air and the fresh smell of pine needles. The team leader commented, Boys, this is Paradise. That is how they say Paradise was born. Over generations, thousands of people came to live there. They worked in gold mines and harvested trees from the forests. They built homes, schools, businesses, and places of religion. But in a few hours last week, much of that was destroyed. It is estimated that the fire has destroyed 9,000 homes and hundreds of businesses. The Honey Run Covered Bridge, built in 1886, was among the historic structures lost. Patrick Knuthson's family has lived in Paradise for four generations. He pointed out the burned-out structures that were once a hotel, a pawn shop, a property office, a liquor store, and an auto repair shop, and his favorite Mexican restaurant. People who live in Paradise say children could bike to the park and go fishing in the pond. As they got older, they would play in the river or hike in the forests after school. Caitlin Norton, whose uncle is still missing, does not know if her home still stands. She told the Associated Press, We could tell the kids to go outside and play and be back when the streetlights come on. Harold Taylor moved to Paradise eight years ago to care for his mother until she died. Taylor said, The most cherished thing for me about Paradise were the summer nights my mother and I would sit out on the porch under the clear, starry night. The Gold Nugget Museum, a reminder of the town's gold mining past, was damaged. Each spring, there were Gold Nugget Days to mark the discovery of a 54-pound gold nugget in 1859. The people would hold a parade to recreate how miners carried the heavy nugget into town. My daughter's going out for the Gold Nugget Queen this year said Kristen Harvey, whose home burned down. Well, it's been going on for a hundred years, but we don't know. There's no town now, she said. Tom Hurst is 67 years old. 
he grew up in paradise and raised horses at his outlaw's roost ranch. He said, Paradise is everything the name implies. Hearst refuses to talk about the town as something of the past. Some buildings still stand, including the town hall, the 750-seat Performing Arts Center, and the Feather River Hospital. Don't use the word was, use the word is, because we ain't done. We're just getting restarted, Hearst said. Activists who helped start the 2014 Umbrella Movement protests in Hong Kong go on trial Monday. Benny Tai, Chan Kinman, and Chu Yuming face charges including plotting and inciting to carry out a public nuisance, as well as incitement to incite a public nuisance. The three defendants face up to seven years in prison. The three are described as being the first to propose in 2013 what later became called the Umbrella Movement. The movement was then called Occupy Central with Love and Peace. The protesters were partly influenced by the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York City at about that time. The Hong Kong activists were seeking to increase openness in the city's process for electing high officials. They also wanted mainland China to keep its promise to permit greater voting rights. Chan said, the group did not expect to face serious charges. He said past activists who took similar action had faced charges related to gathering large groups. They would just be charged for unauthorized assembly or participation in unlawful assembly, Chen said. Chen said he did not expect charges that can carry so much prison time. Chen and Tai are both established college professors and Chu is a Baptist minister. They are unlike other young activists in the Umbrella Movement, such as Joshua Wong, who became world famous at the age of 18. Wong has expressed concern about the three men. He noted that they became democracy activists before he was born. He said he was especially worried about Chu, who is in his seventies. The three will be tried along with six other defendants who face similar charges. These include legislators Tanya Chan and Xu Kachun. The media has called the whole group the Umbrella Nine. Hong Kong's Department of Justice said the trial is opening four years after the protests because of its complexity and the amount of evidence involved. The department said it would not comment on the charges against the nine. It also said it did not know the number of people who faced charges as a result of the protests. The demonstrations in 2014 took place in several areas of Hong Kong for 79 days. Activists were seeking direct election of the city's top leaders and full voting rights for citizens by 2017. 
mainland China had promised Hong Kong the expanded rights as part of the plan that returned the city to Chinese control. About 220 protesters linked to the Umbrella Movement have faced charges since the end of 2014. One rights activist's list says that 78 have been found guilty. Protest leaders Nathan Law, Alex Chow, and Joshua Wong are the best-known activists to face trial. At first, they were sentenced to community service. An appeals court later changed their sentences to six to eight months in jail. Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal canceled that ruling in February. Chan said he hopes something similar will happen to the Umbrella Nine. The Court of Final Appeal had already made a ruling saying as long as people act out of conscience and as long as people are not involved in violence, they shouldn't be sent to jail, Chen said. Chen added that judges in the lower courts can have very different opinions. Those decisions can be changed by higher courts. But you know, for the appeal process, it can take years, he said. I'm Mario Ritter. The Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year is toxic. The British publisher defines the adjective toxic as poisonous. The word first appeared in English in the 1650s. It came from the Latin word toxicus, meaning poisoned. The Latin word itself actually came from the Greek term toxon, meaning bow. In ancient Greece, fighters with bows would put poison on the points of their arrows. Oxford chooses a word of the year that best describes the mood of the past year. The word also should have lasting potential as a term of cultural importance. Oxford said its data showed a 45% rise in searches for the word toxic on its website in 2018. The searches began with the toxic chemical poisoning of former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter in Britain. Then in Syria, a toxic chemical weapon attack killed at least 40 people and led to a missile strike from the United States. The public also was concerned about toxic gas after a series of hurricanes and other storms. Others worried about the burning of toxic waste in India and toxic air pollution around the world. In the American state of Florida, huge numbers of dead fish washed up on the beaches because of toxic algae. But the increasingly common phrase, toxic environment, has nothing to do with pollution. Oxford says people searched for this phrase in connection to unpleasant workplace environments, including the worldwide walkout of Google employees. They were protesting sexual wrongdoing, unequal pay, and discrimination. Others wanted to know about toxic relationships, 
especially connected to the hashtag MeToo movement against sex abuse and the confirmation hearing of Brett Kavanaugh as a U.S. Supreme Court justice. The word gaslighting was another top word of 2018, Oxford says. It defines the word as the action of manipulating someone by psychological means into accepting a false depiction of reality or doubting their own sanity. It says the word has been used to describe claims by the administration of President Donald Trump that the media are spreading fake news. Gaslighting is also used to describe the British government position on Brexit, Britain's withdrawal from the European Union. I'm Brian Lynn. Next up is American Stories. Here is Shep O'Neill with the Ransom of Red Chief by O. Henry. It looked like a good thing, but wait till I tell you. We were down south in Alabama, Bill Driscoll and myself, when this kidnapping idea struck us. There was a town down there as flat as a pancake and called Summit. Bill and I had about $600. We needed just $2,000 more for an illegal land deal in Illinois. We chose for our victim the only child of an influential citizen named Ebenezer Dorset. He was a boy of 10 with red hair. Bill and I thought that Ebenezer would pay a ransom of $2,000 to get his boy back, but wait till I tell ya. About two miles from Summit was a little mountain covered with cedar trees. There was an opening on the back of the mountain. We stored our supplies in that cave. One night, we drove a horse and carriage past old Dorset's house. The boy was in the street throwing rocks at a cat on the opposite fence. Hey, little boy, says Bill, would you like to have a bag of candy and a nice ride? The boy hits Bill directly in the eye with a piece of rock. That boy put up a fight like a wild animal but at last we got him down in the bottom of the carriage and drove away. We took him up to the cave. The boy had two large bird feathers stuck in his hair. He points a stick at me and says, Ha, pale face, do you dare to enter the camp of Red Chief, the terror of the plains? He's all right now, says Bill, rolling up his pants and examining wounds on his legs. We're playing Indian. I'm old Hank, the trapper, Red Chief's captive. I'm going to be scalped at daybreak by Geronimo. That kid can kick hard. Red Chief, says I to the boy, would you like to go home? Ah, oh, what for, says he. I don't have any fun at home. I hate to go to school. I like to camp out. You won't take me back home again, will you? Not right away, says I. We'll stay here in the cave for a while. All right, says he. That'll be fine. I never had such fun in all my life. We went to bed about 11 o'clock. Just at daybreak, I was awakened by a series of terrible screams from Bill. 
Red Chief was sitting on Bill's chest with one hand holding his hair. In the other, he had a sharp knife. He was attempting to cut off the top of Bill's head based on what he had declared the night before. I got the knife away from the boy, but after that event, Bill's spirit was broken. He lay down, but he never closed an eye again in sleep as long as that boy was with us. Do you think anybody will pay out money to get a little imp like that back home? Bill asked. Sure, I said. A boy like that is just the kind that parents love. Now, you and the chief get up and make something to eat while I go up on the top of this mountain and look around. I climbed to the top of the mountain. Over toward summit, I expected to see the men of the village searching the countryside, but all was peaceful. Perhaps, says I to myself, it has not yet been discovered that the wolves have taken the lamb from the fold. I went back down the mountain. When I got to the cave, I found Bill backed up against the side of it. He was breathing hard with the boy threatening to strike him with a rock. He put a red-hot potato down my back, explained Bill, and then crushed it with his foot. I hit his ears. Have you got a gun with you, Sam? I took the rock away from the boy and ended the argument. I'll fix you, says the boy to Bill. No man ever yet struck the Red Chief but what he got paid for it. You better be careful. After eating, the boy takes a leather object with strings tied around it from his clothes and goes outside the cave, unwinding it. Then we heard a kind of shout. It was Red Chief holding a sling in one hand, he moved it faster and faster around his head. Just then I heard a heavy sound and a deep breath from Bill. A rock, the size of an egg, had hit him just behind his left ear. Bill fell in the fire across the frying pan of hot water for washing the dishes. I pulled him out and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. Then I went out and caught that boy and shook him. If your behavior doesn't improve, says I, I'll take you straight home. Now are you going to be good or not? I was only funnin', says he. I didn't mean to hurt old Hank, but what did he hit me for? I'll behave if you don't send me home. I thought it best to send a letter to old man Dorset that day, demanding the ransom and telling how it should be paid. The letter said, we have your boy hidden in a place far from Summit. We demand $1,500 for his return, the money to be left at midnight tonight at the same place and in the same box as your answer. If you agree to these terms, send the answer in writing by a messenger tonight at half past eight o'clock. After crossing Owl Creek, on the road to Poplar Cove, there are three large trees. At the bottom of the fence, opposite the third tree, will be a small box. The messenger will place the answer in this box and return immediately to Summit. If you fail to agree to our demand, you will never see your boy again. If you pay the money as demanded, 
he will be returned to you safe and well within three hours. I took the letter and walked over to Poplar Cove. I then sat around the post office and store. An old man there says he hears Summit is all worried because of Ebenezer Dorset's boy having been lost or stolen. That was all I wanted to know. I mailed my letter and left. The postmaster said the mail carrier would come by in an hour to take the mail on to Summit. <laughs> At half past eight, I was up in the third tree, waiting for the messenger to arrive. Exactly on time, a half-grown boy rides up the road on a bicycle. He finds the box at the foot of the fence. He puts a folded piece of paper into it and leaves, turning back toward Summit. I slid down the tree, got the note, and was back at the cave in a half hour. I opened the note and read it to Bill. This is what it said. Gentlemen, I received your letter about the ransom you ask for the return of my son. I think you're a little high in your demands. I hereby make you a counter-proposal which I believe you will accept. You bring Johnny home and pay me $250, and I agree to take him off your hands. You had better come at night, because the neighbors believe he is lost, and I could not be responsible for what they would do to anybody they saw bringing him back. Very respectfully, Ebenezer Dorset. Great pirates of Penzance, says I, of all the nerve. But I looked at Bill and stopped. He had the most appealing look in his eyes I ever saw on the face of a dumb or talking animal. Sam, says he, what's $250 after all? We've got the money. One more night of this boy will drive me crazy. I think Mr. Dorset is making us a good offer. You aren't going to let the chance go, are you? Tell you the truth, Bill, says I. This little lamb has got on my nerves, too. We'll take him home, pay the ransom, and make our getaway. We took him home that night. We got him to go by telling him that his father had bought him a gun and we were going to hunt bears the next day. It was 12 o'clock when we knocked on Ebenezer's front door. Bill counted out $250 into Dorset's hand. When the boy learned we were planning to leave him at home, he started to cry loudly and held himself as tight as he could to Bill's leg. His father pulled him away, slowly. Uh, how long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not as strong as I used to be, says old Dorset. But I think I can promise you ten minutes. Enough, says Bill. In ten minutes, I shall cross the central, southern, and middle western states and be running for the Canadian border. And as dark as it was, and as fat as Bill was, and as good a runner as I am, he was a good mile and a half out of Summit before I could catch up with him. <laughs> That's our show for today. For VOA Learning English, I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks for listening.